He was on a lifelong journey of life and art. This is the story of an idea. From a rough sketch on a tabletop, it grew into this. It's very compelling and it's very emotionally driven. It's a tale set in a small Arizona town. People come here and there's just this magical magnetic energy that you just feel like I'm home. It's about one man's dogged determination, obsession, and sheer stubbornness, and how it transformed a community. I can't say that I've ever been to anywhere else like Elefante. Sedona is in Arizona, in the southwestern portion of the United States. Elevation is 4,300 feet. We are at the base of what they call the Mogollon Rim. Sedona is partially desert and partially mountains. Sedona is located between Phoenix and Flagstaff in high desert country. It's an area famous for breathtaking scenery and red rock outcrops that resemble a Martian landscape. It's been uh, many, many millions of years ago. This was once an ancient ocean. You can actually see where the water carved out areas. So as the land rose, came the sandstone. So everything around here is sandstone. What to do here? Um, hiking and being out of doors is probably the biggest thing. Sightseeing, taking a Jeep tour, hiking. Did I say hiking? There's a lot of hiking around here. Six miles south of Sedona, near the little town of Cornville, is a strange place that stands out from the landscape. It's like nothing else one has ever seen. For those who experience it, this site is the highlight of their trip. Welcome to Elefante, an artist's retreat where every open door is an invitation to enter and be amazed. I do remember that my first impression of Elefante was just, wow, this is really, really cool. Everywhere was art. Rocks were painted, the trees were painted. Things were balanced that made no sense in ways that were magical. What is this magical but mysterious place? It defies description or categorization. To some, these structures might seem inspired by storybook hobbits. But Ilifante is a real work of art, a modern architectural fantasy spread out over three acres. From the outside, it may look odd and primitive, but inside, there's a world of dazzling marvels. Some visitors even feel they've entered another dimension. Most of Villafante's building materials and decor consist of scavenged and found objects. And like the wilderness that inspired its creation, there's not a single straight line or flat surface anywhere. But the most intriguing part of this live-in sculpture is that it was conceived by one man and built with the help of his partner, a woman who also committed the greater part of her life to make it happen. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. This is the story of Elefante. And now we're on the way to Elefante. You've got a great guide. I am Lida Levant Khan. I was born in New York City, and life catapulted me through Cape Cod, where I met Michael Khan, who was the main creator of everything you will see at Elefante. And we lived here for 38, tw 28 to 30 years. We had no idea it would turn out to be what it turned out to be. This just had a life of its own. At first, it was just going to be this round, roundish space that we would live in. But I think it was me, I had the idea, well, let's have a little place at the beginning where we can take off our shoes and sit down on the bench. Then we added the trunk. That's when 
Bob Crozier, who owned the land, he looked at the structure and he said, Elefante. It was a joke. You know, it looked like an elephant to him. And the name just landed and it's been Elefante ever since. Michael Kahn died in 2007, but his wife Lita will never forget her husband who created Elefante and the epic journey they shared to build it. Their love story is as exceptional as Elefante itself. It's a story that begins in the late 1960s. Lita is vacationing in Cape Cod with her family when she meets Michael and discovers his paintings. Michael was an artist, you know, in the true, in the true sense. You know, Michael, he lived on the Cape and uh, he did oil painting. Actually, he, his art, everything was art to Michael. His artistry is what, what caught me originally. I, I saw one of his paintings in Provincetown and that painting kind of lured me into it. In a way, it frightened me. It was dark purple and black colors. And I looked at it and I said, Lita, you're afraid of a painting? Come on, what's going on? And then there was Michael who created the painting and it all fit together perfectly. He was a uh, wonderful man, open, kind, good sense of humor, accepting, uh, the kind of guy you want to get to know better. Michael was irresistible. And I don't just mean that in, in a love sense. His energy was contagious and irresistible. It's love at first sight for both. There's no turning away as Lita gives in to an impulse to follow her soulmate. I, I just knew it was time for me to move on. And within three months, I left my family, my husband and my two children and moved in with Michael. You fall in love and you throw everything in the air and you leave. I, I, it's unheard of, but it's really beautiful. Michael was convinced that the middle of Arizona is the place we should be. And he said, we can paint outdoors. We don't need to pay for a studio. We can garden, have our own food. So that's when we bought this old truck, put it together, and set forth. What you're looking at is bocce, which means it was a botched job when we created it. Yeah, it wasn't like Mike was a millionaire and he'd come stay in my mansion. <laughs> he had nothing. You know, he lived in the car. Oh, my God. <laughs> With only a handful of art supplies and the shirts on their backs, Michael and Lita head west for Sedona to reinvent a new life together, bursting with creativity. For two years, the old truck is their only home. Then one day, they finally find what they've been searching for. By some miracle, we met the people who own this land in Cornville. And they said we could come and live here free of charge and do our artwork and have a garden. And that's just what we were looking for. Undeeded, no lease, no paperwork, just a, sh a handshake. And they stayed there for 25 years. And there was absolutely nothing here but a meadow. Working together, Michael and Lita till the soil, cultivate crops, and live off the land. When we moved here, this was very primitive living, chopping wood, no telephone, and of course, no, no bathroom facilities. That was, nature provided that for us. We never knew what the next day or the next adventure or non-adventure was going to be. Free thinking, free living, unconventional, unrestrained, broke. Michael was happy. I mean, money to Michael was in the way. Michael and Leader were hippies. Of course, I'd grown up in New York City in an apartment building with an elevator and push buttons for everything, and here I was having the time of my life. The food they grow on the three acres feeds their bodies, but it's the surrounding landscape that nourishes their creativity. In the process, Michael the painter becomes Michael the builder, in spite of the fact he has no previous construction experience. That didn't stop Michael. He just went right ahead with, with his shovel and just dug into the hillside.
Did he have a plan? No. Did he have any permits? No. He just started building. I, it wasn't the knowledge of an architect in any sense. He was creating as he went along. It was a, a sensing. He always followed an inner voice, and he might have done a little scribble, but he never put down the dimensions of anything or exactly what materials were going to be used because, first of all, the materials were mostly what came our way. As you can see, it's mostly made of rock, local rocks that came from the hillside. Came, they didn't come, we had to get them. <laughs> rocks came from the hillside. <laughs> That's pretty ridiculous. Look at the size of this. I don't even remember how, how we got it here. But that's one heavy rock. The muscles were great in those days. Michael was a scavenger. A lot of this stuff was scavenged from all over the place. He'd, he'd spend months going down to the creek and getting driftwood. Driftwood played a big part in our lives, as you can see. That's a piece of driftwood, and this is a piece of driftwood. Michael never bought a thing that I am aware of. For example, all of the uh, green indoor outdoor carpeting, that came from the tennis court in Cottonwood. Michael saw them tearing it up and he said, hey, can I have a piece of that? They said, you have to take it all. So Michael covered Elefante in it. This smorgasbord of bizarre materials turns Elefante into something exceptional. From its clay pottery and old windshield wiper blades to patches of carpeting and plastic scraps, Mylar, you may know from birthday balloons, those shiny birthday balloons. Lita and Michael are always on the hunt for new building materials. In the process, they acquire a talent for getting what they need free of charge. We would go to building sites in the area, and we'd scrounge and take what was obviously their garbage heap. If they were bent nails, we'd spend the next day straightening out the nails. Saved a lot of money that way, and a lot more interesting things, probably got created than if you have everything right there and you know how it's going to work out. With Michael, building was a creative, creative adventure. This was all scrap wood that we got from building sites in Sedona. And he'd sit up all night carving and somebody donated some stained glass and he would take a hammer and to crash it into hundreds of pieces. They were just glued onto plate glass, which we would find in junk heaps. We thought we would live in it, but as we worked, we could tell that it was turning into an art form. He was making what I would call a three-dimensional painting. Wonderful, wonderful. He would turn everything that he worked on or touched into a piece of artwork. He would paint the rocks, he would paint the walls, he would paint the ceiling. He would use all the materials that came his way as if they were paints, creating a painting with, with cutting up pieces of rug to put them together, the way he fit the rocks together. He could even close his eyes and whatever he reached for, there would be a place to put it. He had fun doing his artwork. Michael was a uh, genius of working in the moment and making every moment count in his creative production. It's just incredible, you know, the amount of work that's gone into this and basically by one, one guy, you know, one little guy lifting all of these boulders and placing all of these rocks, it's, you know, it's, it's incredible, it's beautiful. first years we lived here, since we knew no one, there was nobody helping us. But um, it wasn't until later that people started to hear about this special place, and people started to visit here. And there were always people who wanted to pitch in and help. Ilifante starts out as a solo adventure, but the wider community soon realizes something unique is taking shape. People, like myself, uh, who live in town here, would go down and 
and hang out with Mike. Help him build, fix things, paint things, whatever. Michael's passion to create was contagious. People would come just to see what we were doing, and they would do everything from mixing cement to, to gathering driftwood to putting rocks where, where rock walls was to be. I remember we had a, a plastering party out here, and, and it, was, it was just fun, you know? And the thing about working with Michael, is there was no plans, no levels or string lines, no straight edges, you know? It was an idea, and the idea changed as it evolved and I learned a lot from him. He probably taught me more about the true sense of building something than I learned from anybody else. We were not builders, but boy, we sure built. Eventually, all that labor results in a small village with more than a dozen structures, like a solar bathhouse, a luxury guest apartment, an open air kitchen, and a studio gallery to exhibit Michael's paintings. This was his canvas, you know, and it was a never-ending canvas. It just went on forever. You know, he would never admit it, but I think every day was a hard time for Michael and Lita out here. And, you know, this is, this is a beautiful place. This is like going camping, but this is camping for a lot of years, you know what I mean? So every day was a chore. It was like living like pioneers. There were days and times in the early years that I really struggled Michael never struggled or he never seemed to struggle. He just accepted whatever was. He was pretty zen-like. And I had to pretend I was zen-like. It was good that I had part-time jobs elsewhere. I mean, we needed the money, but for me to be here all the time, night and day, sun and cold, it was tough. During this time, Lita is the sole breadwinner. She hitchhikes every day into Sedona looking for work to help make ends meet. One of those jobs is modeling for the well-known sculptor, John Waddell. They were living in their vehicle, which they, Michael had painted, and they were doing whatever it took to survive, I think. I've done this all my life, so I know what both hands are doing. I don't even have to look at it, you know. It's great fun. And, uh... Lita actually posed for me for uh, maybe a drawing or something like that. In no time, a deep friendship built on mutual respect develops between both couples. The life was rugged, but uh, you know there are rewards for that. Being in the outdoors is rewarding at the same time it's hard. It was tough but no regrets. In spite of their many hardships, Lita and Michael don't let anything come between them and the life they've chosen, but it doesn't last. In early 2000, their lives take a major downturn. I noticed there was something different about Michael two years before he was diagnosed with Pick's disease. Pick's is, a, is a, uh, associated with Alzheimer's disease. He began losing the skills that People learn from childhood on up, even balancing two sticks. He would wander through the meadow and try to get these two sticks to do what he wanted them to do, and he couldn't do it. He couldn't speak. He could just gesticulate a little bit. But at the same time, he knew how to paint. That, that never left him. The last painting he did, and it started out in, in these beautiful turquoise, white, aqua colors in the typical Michael Kahn design. And as Michael's disease progressed, the painting from the top to the bottom got darker and darker and more red and more red. And finally, when Mike passed, the whole painting was all blocked out in red. And he died on the winter solstice in December 21st of 2007. Living here alone, everywhere I looked, there was Michael. He was behind a tree, he was gathering rocks, he was doing what he always did. And I was weeping the whole time. To escape her grief, Lita moves to New Mexico to live with her son. All she brings to remind herself of Ilifanti are Michael's paintings on canvas. 
The world she's known for 28 years is all but abandoned. Although Ilifante is nearing completion when Michael takes ill, with his death and Lita's absence, it begins to fall into ruin. It's a place that could deteriorate very, very fast unless there's somebody taking care of it all the time. And that was Michael's everyday thing. And I didn't really know then what the future was going to hold. Without a caretaker and short of a miracle, Ilifante is destined to fade back into the desert from which it emerged. The sudden arrival of a young bohemian couple in search of something worthwhile to do with their lives brings new hope that Elefante can be resurrected. My name is Ryan Matson. I was a native Oregonian and lived in Portland for most of my life. And Tracy and I had the opportunity to move to Arizona. We were seeking a bit more of a nomadic lifestyle and wanted to have a few places that we could call home. We really wanted to live in a place where we could grow our own food and live off the land as much as possible, and Elefante opened itself up to us. Like Michael and Lita before them, Ryan and Tracy also get permission from the property owners to live on the site. It allows them to restore and preserve Michael's art project. Back in New Mexico, Lita decides she can't stay away forever from something that's still so much a part of her. I realized that I missed the community of friends I had here. My heart was still here at Elefante. This was my life for 30 years. And it's very joyous and comforting to be back here. Now the creek was such an important part of our lives here, for better and worse. Just lazed around on a hot day. days of crying are finished. I weep occasionally, but on with life. With Lita's homecoming and the commitment of its new caretakers, Elefante just might have a future. Come on, let's go. It's oh. oh. great. Oh. I hope I dry off in time for dinner. Elefante has been through lots of ups and downs over its 35-year history, but it has always been a magnet for people with free spirits and inquiring minds. Together, Lita, Ryan, and Tracy are doing their best to make sure that doesn't change. Elefante, I think, has got one of those lives of its own, and it's being discovered by more people now. At the moment, a younger couple are now the live-in directors uh, caretakers spearheading Elefante onto its next role in life. Because Michael and I did not really know how to build, I admit that totally, over the years there's been a lot of deterioration of partial, of the parts of the walls crumbling, things are coming loose. Can you see that partly partly damaged building. That was Michael's last painting studio. Elefante really um, presented itself to us at the opportunity that it needed us. It was really serendipitous. When we first came here, Elefante was really kind of almost dilapidated. It was, it was, nature was taking it back. And the landowners were really concerned about the buildings falling over and stuff like that. All the sand that we built with if this got punctured, the whole ceiling would fall down. Building by building, Ryan and Tracy are gradually reinforcing the walls and roofs and generally repairing anything else that could pose a danger to the visitors who come here. We're investing all of our love and creativity and effort into restoring and keeping this place around for others to be inspired by it. We like to repurpose things, and we like to show how things have been repurposed here. So a lot of it's the celebration of materials as they are, rather than requiring something that might not be available. Like maybe fence building out of hollow reeds, 
And we've also done some cob work, which is sand, straw, clay, and water. And it's very tactile, it's very hands-on. Doing mosaic work or doing tuck point work on some, some deteriorating mortar, so. There's still a lot more repairs that need to be done, but it always feels worth it, just because when we do get to share this place with others, they feel so uplifted and inspired that it makes it all seem worth it. They like to believe that Michael's spirit is still present, approving and guiding every restoration and upgrade they make. Oh, you've got water. Oh, my goodness. Oh, how wonderful. I'm just so thrilled to see the water. It's been dry for so long. I wonder what they did. Oh. <laughs> They're really moving in the right direction, and I think it's wonderful that Tracy and Ryan are here now. Restoring this site is a long-term commitment, but Lita and Elefante's new guardians believe they will succeed. And why not? Their creativity and energy is powered by mystical forces that, some say, come straight from the Sedona landscape. Tourists visit Arizona for its main attraction, the spectacular Grand Canyon. But the town of Sedona has its own special appeal. There is something about Sedona that um, is magical, just magical. It's a place where you discover yourself. Michael did when he and Lita settled here and began to put his surreal vision into action. No doubt the natural beauty of the high desert attracts tourists, but what really brings them flocking here is what lies beneath the rock and the sand. Many people have sensed an extraordinary and powerful energy in this red landscape. It's a phenomenon they claim defies explanation. There's something about Sedona. Well, they, they call it red rock fever. People come here and there's just this magical magnetic energy that you just feel like I'm home. When you've been here for a few days and you leave, you can kind of feel your energy just kind of, ah. and when you come back, you get close within 10 miles, whoop, you can feel the energy. People believe the same is true of Elefante. Michael was convinced this energy fed directly into his manual labor and his art. Michael was very sensitive, even though he was a strong, dynamic guy, but, and he felt that it was full moon energy all the time in Sedona. It's been said that um, underneath the ground here are gigantic crystals, and that's where the energy is supposed to be coming from. Some call it the vortex. Some don't know what it is. Some call this woo-woo. I don't know what to call it, but I just know there's something going on. That something is the reason Sedona has become a mecca for New Agers. It entices those seeking higher levels of consciousness, such as Buddhists, as well as scores of creative artists in search of inspiration. Sedona actually started as an artist colony. Uh, back in the uh, 40s, it became popular and it grew and grew and grew to where it is now, where there's probably 50 galleries in this town with world-renowned artists. Art exhibitions, concerts, and film festivals pack the community's annual calendar of cultural events. Whether one does or doesn't believe in magical magnetic forces, it seems that people do come here, first and foremost, for inspiration. Before I moved to Arizona, I didn't really expect much. Like, I didn't think that there was, it was just desert, you know, and cactus and um, dry dead world and it's not at all it's, it's amazing michael had the same response when he first arrived in sedona and it inspired him to create elefante michael wasn't alone everyone who's come here since feels that chemistry because of it elefante is now a star attraction in sedona's unique landscape Visitors who come for a tour of Elefante are sometimes greeted by a very special guide. Here we go. Watch your step. What we're in right now is his first experiment. This first structure was meant to be Lita's and Michael's home. Their experiment with live-in art broke all the rules, although the structure had all the usual domestic features. Up there is a southern view. That was going to be a greenhouse. Sleep up there. Have a little kitchen over here. 
We had a, a, a stove down here. So this is where I was gonna wash the dishes. And this space, this was gonna be a storage cabinet for canned foods and books or whatever. And you never know if a mouse will jump out at you. This magnificent structure got to be called Lita's Winter Palace. Michael and Lita built this one after his first experiment turned out to be more of a work of art than a practical place to live. Lita's Winter Palace is one of several buildings at Ilifante constructed along somewhat more conventional lines. It was my palace. Michael didn't care what he lived in. As long as he could paint and create, we had in there place for our clothing. We put two mats down on the floor to sleep on, a library. We had a little wood-burning stove, and we had some great meals there. And it really served its purpose beautifully. So this is Pagoda. The pagoda served as Michael's studio and guest house. Like Lita's winter palace, it was slightly more traditional and could be erected fairly quickly. Rusted parts from the old truck they called Bachi provided some of the finishing details. We took the back covering off Bachi. You can see the original curve. Wow. Well, visitors who, or family members could sleep here. Everything you see was donated. We had no money to buy anything. And I love what they've done with the stained glass here. Here's the Hippodome. So we've got the elephant, we've got the hippopotamus. Here we go. For Lita, the Hippodome is pure luxury. It's easy to see why. This became the main hangout. Construction of the Hippodome began a few years after their arrival. Unlike every other building, they actually spent some money on it. So we were able to buy materials and not scrounge as much as we had scrounged before. A totally functional, modern kitchen right here in the midst of Elefante. The best kitchen I've ever lived in it was a wood-burning stove, electricity, and we even had a jacuzzi. Now it's used as a, a wood pile. Essentially, this was a very comfortable place to live in. There's a sleeping loft above. It's kind of like rock climbing almost. Um, and then you have a nice view from up here. We've had the opportunity to see this artwork evolve even from building to building. You can see his skills get tighter and more refined, more precise in this sort of abstract world he's created. This was one of Michael's inventions. This is an air tube. In the summer, it brought cool air in, and in the winter, from a solar cooker out there, it brought hot air in, and it was very helpful. It's interesting. Michael envisioned pipe dreams as an art gallery where he could exhibit his paintings in a rather unique way. Michael's idea to show his paintings always had been to see one painting at a time in the chronological progression that he created it. So he thought, we'll have an underground cooler area and he would create a maze. This maze of tunnels is the most complicated structure Michael ever conceived, and he needed lots of extra hands to craft it. The windows are placed so that at certain times of day, the, the natural light would come on a specific painting. It's the first time in years that Lita has set foot inside. Each step stirs another memory. Oh, my goodness. Ah. This place has changed a lot since Michael's death. Curtains now hang in place of stone walls that were taken down so Michael's large canvases could be removed. 
If the original walls were here, you would see how the light would hit just one canvas at a time. I mean, you see feats out here that aren't codified, that wouldn't be allowed today, um, things that people just haven't tried. This fireplace does work, or it used to work. I'm sure it still works. There's elements of sound and light that happen here that you don't see in traditional buildings. Um, textural elements are off the chart. And it became a really um, major place for people to visit when they came to Elefante. It was an experience of living through Mike's life as an artist in, in Provincetown and here in Cornville, Arizona. It puts Cornville on the map. I mean, there's not a whole lot of attractions in Cornville, but this is a very unique place that people from all over the world seek out. Mike, being an artist, he invited all the other artists to come and play. There were a lot of gatherings there. Most of them were spontaneous. Oh, and we play music. Ah, oh, how can I forget that? Michael loved to play music, but it wasn't, it wasn't real music. He never read music. It wasn't a song. He would just sort of pick up a rhythm and start playing with it. That way, you know, oh, was that wonderful. We called it music of the common land or free music, more like children in kindergarten would beat on a drum or blow on a recorder. Find a key on the piano and just keep playing that key or strum a ukulele and just do the, the same chord over and over. Many, many a party got started and finished playing music. There's not gonna be right. 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 Okay. Okay. Who wants this weapon? Okay, fine. The social gatherings that nourished Michael and Lita and their local community are still alive and well at Elefante as Ryan and Tracy continue the tradition. The couple is committed to protecting Elefante's physical structures, but there's more to the legacy, and that's preserving the community spirit that Michael and Lita believe was so important. We saw that we couldn't do it alone, so we really immediately reached for outside support and wanted to find who cared about Elefante and who wanted to help us um, bring Elefante up to what it is now. Oh. <laughs> I missed you. On Tuesdays and Sundays, we do volunteer days, so our friends know that those are the days that they can come over and put in a few hours, and we'll take a dip in the creek and share a meal and have some fun and do some work also. And we're painting the sheets with fabric dye, and we're going to spray them on ourselves, too. <laughs> what? Our volunteers are usually artistic types or um, people that are creative, inspired. Just anyone that sees the, sees the need and wants to give in. I don't know. I come out here pretty religiously because I, I do like to kind of escape and play. And well, I'm gonna butcher Michael's quote, but everybody's an artist or a musician unless they're told otherwise, so. There's a whole younger generation of people involved here now, and I'm totally behind what they're doing. He didn't leave any disciples, <laughs> but he left a philosophy, he left something that was unique. It's kind of missing where I want some blue arm patch. I want to try it with just like a, oh, thank you. I got pulled here, you know, and now I'm just feeling really lucky to just do whatever I can, use whatever talents I might have to, to help. But, um, but I feel really lucky to be here and be a part of it. The people that are taking care of this place, they feel real good too. I'm, I'm happy and I'm gonna have to start coming out here more. It's time for me to come out here more. Elefante has a new lease on life, thanks to the young couple who maintains it like a sacred trust. But that won't guarantee its future. Like Michael and Lita before them, Ryan and Tracy don't own the land, and they must depend on donations and volunteers for Elefante's continuous upkeep. It was always a struggle, and the struggle goes on 
because it requires financial assistance that has been difficult to come by. Ryan and Tracy encourage all visitors to Arizona to come to Ilifante because the future of this place depends on them. I, I can't emphasize enough how much love and care Tracy and Ryan have given to Elefante, but what they need is funding and help because two people alone cannot restore Elefante. I hope that it doesn't just disintegrate. I don't think it will. I think it'll turn into a ruins, but I think it'll be a ruins that'll be visited and appreciated. I hope that's the case. In spite of their struggles, Ryan and Tracy are optimistic, and the reason is because of the people who visit Ilifante. Everyone who comes is amazed by what they learn. The story of an inspired artist and his soulmate who made magic together in this red desert. Yeah, we plan on staying here, and we plan on restoring and repairing all of the buildings. Um, we would like it to have like a museum status. Um, we hope to have saunas, sort of a spa element that will keep people that are here comfortable. We love to have artist retreats and, um, you know, community gatherings, potlucks, all of those kind of things. Nobody else can come in and renovate that experience, but it's worth for mankind. Dinner time! <laughs> It's going to be great. There's not many places like this. This is something everybody should experience. This is every kid's tree house and foxhole that any kid would ever want. I think the messages that Michael was trying to send was the beauty that one sees and things that are not expensive. Found objects can be magnificent. He could turn found objects into beautiful, beautiful works of art. That to me is talent, pure, raw talent. It's very compelling and it's very emotionally driven. I can't say that I've ever been to anywhere else like Elefante. We're going to toast to Elefante, to a long, long future life and participation from many, many friendly people with strong muscles and deep pockets. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Drink up. Sweet.